Today's Morphin Network video is sponsored by Ranger Stop and Pop, which is now August the 27th to the 29th, 2021 in Atlanta, Georgia. And Ranger Stock Convention, which is now November 11th to the 14th, 2021 in Orlando, Florida. Go to rangerstop.com for more info. Double face. Who are these multicolored creatures who battle Master Rider? Unfortunately, the ship's computer is unable to identify them, my lord. But clearly, they also seek to possess Masked Rider's powers, so they too must be destroyed! Fun! This is really fun! Too bad his grandfather can't help him now. <laughs> So Mr. Merck, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing very well. How are you two doing? We're doing well. It's a nice uh, 4th of July weekend. It's still a day off today. Technically, I had to work today, so ugh. But anyway. Uh, and I'm very excited to finally get to interview an actor from Mass Rider. <laughs> yeah, he's a huge Kamen Rider fan. So. Yes, very huge Kamen Rider fan. <laughs> well, we, um, we uh, you know, in Pasadena, they have the the calm yeah, the kind of, and we had about half of the cast there. And I want to say that was somewhere in the early two thousands, but that's the last time I did any kind of comms uh, for, you know, Saban or, or any of this power ranger stuff for, and some fans of mass rider came out. I actually was working at the U at UCLA and some of the students were in that age range where they had watched mass rider. I think we had 44 episodes, something like that somewhere. 40 episodes. Not too many, not too little, uh, you know, enough <laughs> somewhere in between to be like maybe memorable, but not uh, remember VR troopers. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was like that. I don't know if they had more episodes than us, but that was about the time I just started with Saban and I, I never did an episode of VR troopers, but they seemed kind of Beetleborgs had a lot more episodes than we did, but yeah, uh, uh, Beetleborgs had 85 episodes. Oh shoot! Really? Yeah, they went on yeah. for a while. It it was like fifty two. No, 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 eighty seven episodes. Fifty two oh. plus thirty five. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, oh. uh, VR Troopers had about ninety two, ninety three episodes. For, oh, okay. Uh, and then uh, and and Mass Rider had exactly forty episodes. So we were the we were the little brother. I mean, when it yeah. came to episodes, we were we were the least. So. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I mean, honestly, if they adapted Black instead of Black RX, they could have done two seasons where the second season would have been Black RX. So, you know, you could have done two seasons if you didn't start with the last season. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I am. Um, now, is it Michael? Is um, that uh, you could call me Mike. Uh, my name is Ukrainian. Okay. Well, um, m well, Mike, um, I, uh, I was... Uh, I don't know what the kind of things that your your, your viewers like to hear, but it, there was a very interesting 
to me, an interesting story contractually for those 40 episodes mm. because I was, you know, our contract went for the first season and then, you know, there were things in the contract for a second season, a third season, mm. and they just wanted to do four more additional episodes. Really? But that put us into the second season mm -hmm. and the contract was non-union back then. It wasn't SAG, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. and, and the pay was horrible for being on television. But um, that by doing those four episodes, episodes, they put us into the second season. So they'd have to pay us for the whole second season. Right. And they called me into their office, the producer. And he's like, uh, we'd like to offer you this sum of money per episode. So mm -hmm. we're not going to. We're not going to renew your second season, but we're going to give you a bigger chunk of change for each episode. And I'm like, well, uh, you're going into the second season. It's up to, you know, if you only want to do four episodes, that's up to you. But my contract says once we get into the second season, you have to pay me for the whole second season. Yeah. And he's like, well, no, no. What we'll do is we'll just pay you more per episode and we're just <laughs> going to do four additional episodes. And I'm like, well, your contract, you know, for season one was not lucrative for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just going to go with, you know, going into the second season and you're going to have to pay me for the whole second season. And, and he's like, well, you're a real ball buster. And, and I'm just like, you guys totally take advantage of all the actors <laughs> on your shows. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, that was, <laughs> that's, that's you know, a secret trading cards with my picture on it. And I'm like, I'm not seeing a cent of any of this uh, merch stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm like, at least you could do is just honor this not so great second season contract. Yeah. And yeah. that was one of the reasons they put me on Beetleborgs was I said, you can do whatever. I mean, you know, since you have to pay me for the whole second season, if you want to, if you want to put that money towards episodes of Beetleborgs, I'm fine. Cause you know, I'm an actor. I want to do more work. And that was one of the reasons I think they put me in two of the episodes of Beetleborgs was okay. they weren't just paying me for, for nothing. Uh, for doing nothing, but those four episodes were those four additional episodes that put us to forty uh, were beneficial for me. <laughs> yes. Um. So hello, guys. Welcome to a very special interview to Morphin Network. We have Kenneth Merckx. Uh, you guys Everybody. remember? Yes. You guys remember he's Count Dragon from Mass Rider. But of course, he did a lot of Power Ranger stuff too. And we actually have his pictures and roles. Mike, going back to memory lane, of course, you know. My favorite, and we have, of course, is Replator Replator uh, from NPR. Yep. And uh, we have Shadow Chromite from Turbo. Yep. I have, Justin's I have the uh, action figure of that. I remember <laughs> that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Translator from also yep. from Turbo, and of course, one of my favorite monsters actually fell for this like loves this guy, <laughs> Lost Pickable. Actually, did like this guy, and. Um, of course, Heart of Choke from Lost Galaxy, which actually scared Episode 20. Me, which scared the crap out of me when I was a kid. I know why. And the first monster I saw in Power Rangers. Yes, this guy was the first monster I saw in Power Rangers when I was a kid. Ghoulay, uh, Ghoulagan from Lights. Not Speed. Psycho Red, but it's still a great entrance to, uh, for the season. Yes. And Mike, who was this monster again? I forgot. Uh, let's have a closer look. Wh wh uh, which season? Uh, it's from it's from Lightspeed, uh, Rescue. Yeah. Lightspeed Rescue. Ah, uh, dang. Hold on. I'm trying to remember. Because, cause, like, the thing about the um, Lightspeed Rescue villains... Oh, I remember. It's Mole Man. Mole Man. There you go. Mole Man. There you go. Mole Man. Yeah, Mole Man. Because I remember there was a Mole Man. Yeah, I remember. My mole. And, of course, uh... Yeah, you guys were, for you Time Force fans, he was a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Research scientist, if I remember appropriately. Yeah, he was a doctor. Yeah, he yeah, yeah, yeah. I also made a serum for you know Rancic, and of course, and one of my and, and and he set Wes on the right path in life. <laughs> yep. And I was up for Rancic, uh, and I just don't think I was evil enough. Like you know, he, I mean, he had done uh, that that actor had done Mad Max or something, and yeah. he was like a little bit bigger name, and he just looked rougher around the edges. And but I was I was kind of in the final. Final, uh, for, final, whatever you know, consideration for that. I was, I was bummed out, but yeah. when I saw his work, I was like, that is, he's definitely a good villain. When I imagine what it would be like to go back in time and give Thomas Edison the modern spiral light bulbs, I just think back. Oh yeah, that one thing kind of happened in the anti-penultimate episode of Time Force. So yeah, it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and last but not least, he was Naser from Wild Force. So, my favorite uh, of the three generals. 
<laughs> General Nazor. And yeah, so it's, so again, let's get the interview started. So, my uh, Kenneth, sorry, Mike, Kenneth, um, how did you start with acting? Um, I uh, went to the University of Washington. This was in the early '80s, <laughs> and uh, you know, you're trying to decide what to do, and I, I just was uh, intrigued by something that kind of challenged you mentally and physically. Um, my dad was a, a very brilliant mathematician and I didn't mind math, I didn't love math and I kind of pretended to be an engineer for a while and then I, I knew my heart wasn't in it and then I went to grad school in Illinois in Urbana-Champaign and got an MFA in acting and did a lot of um, like Shakespeare festivals and I was living in the Bay Area for a couple of years in the early 90s and I was doing uh, live theater and I was I was booking I mean, I was getting like jobs, but they were all non-union. And I was at one point working three different jobs, uh, like doing children's theater, doing Shakespeare in the park and doing a show at the Magic Theater. And I still was like, I think I would be earning more money as a cook, you know, <laughs> earning minimum wage uh, with a full time job. And so that I decided to move to L.A. And I remember when I submitted for Mass Writer, mm. they just said, um, you know, they just they were matching the, obviously, you know, you guys know how the formula works. They were matching someone who would fit in the costume and kind of have the same similar jawline <laughs> as the Japanese actor and kind of be around the same height. And, um, you know, they cast Jennifer Tung as Nefaria mm -hmm. and they cast me. And then of course we never saw any of those other characters that we were on the ship with, uh, you know, there was just the two of us and then they did all the Japanese footage. But I, I think I was cast I don't want to say because of my voice, maybe my, they said my jawline <laughs> was what did it. But I came in and I read, I just read a piece of script and they said, can you give us an evil laugh? And then I gave them an evil laugh. And then a few days later, they, they said, um, we'd like you to come in for a screen test, but you have to sign a contract. And it's like, why do I have to sign a contract to do a s screen test? Like it, essentially I was, I was, I was signing away, I was agreeing to a contract to be considered. And then I, and I was like, this is, and I was relatively new to LA. I didn't kind of know the business too well. And I didn't have a really big time agent yet. So I was like, should I sign this? I mean, I'm, I'm signing a contract just to do a screen test. And then finally someone said, well, if you don't, you know, you, you don't have a lot of credits, it's not the worst thing in the world. And so I finally, signed it and then i found out there was no screen test i was the only person they were considering but they made it sound like well we're considering a lot of people so we just need you to sign this contract to come in and do a screen test we're not sure if we want you but i was the only person they wanted or at least i was the only person they were considering and then i was locked into this really crappy contract <laughs> that i signed to do a screen test uh and that's that story i was telling you you know back about the 40th, you know, the 36th or 37th through the 40th episode getting into my second year and how they were, you know, saying you're being so hardcore on your negotiations. And I'm like, you guys are way, way underpaying everybody and you're kind of abusing us. So um, <laughs> I'm not hardcore. I'm, I just uh, actually bothered to read all 95 pages of the uh, uh, user agreement before agreeing to it. Yeah. <laughs> So, but uh, Mass, I mean, Mass Rider was a lot of fun and it was, it was a great experience for me. And I went into global effects and they fit the costume to me and they're obviously matching the Japanese costume, but they built, you know, my own costume and, and I would come in and they were trying to match the makeup and, um, but we, I was uh, in the sound stages in Santa Clarita, right across from Magic Mountain is where we were filming and right next door to the Power Range, Power Ranger sound stages. And um, I, maybe once or twice, I had an episode where I filmed off the lot, but every time I came in, we would do a cluster of episodes, like three episodes at a time. And I would just come in and knock off my lines. You know, I'd be like, what episode are we in right now? Okay, and you know, <laughs> I would just talk about ruling the universe or, you know, getting the mass rider. And I, I would just knock out the dialogue for those three episodes. So I my filming was always in the same room, always on the same stage and always with the same person. And there was once or twice where I got to, there was one little bit where uh, a monster was attacking the city 
and my brother was visiting me and I, I said, can he play, like, can he be an extra? And my brother is not an actor at all. And so they gave him a feature extra bit of like looking up at the monster, you know, like he's going to get stepped on. It was a huge monster. And he, um, I guess he did an awful job. <laughs> and so they were, they were like, um, hey, Ken, can you just do it? So I actually was a extra in it. I'm sorry, I don't know the episode, but I was an extra as myself. Uh, getting stepped on by some big monster. Really? But, um, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So, how did you get started with voice acting? Um, I when I was in grad school, I, I, I Illinois Urbana-Champaign is a small kind of. It's a big university in a in a agricultural area, just you know, surrounded by wheat, wheat fields. It's about two and a half hours south of Chicago. But I did some. You know, we had voice classes, and and we did we did classes and voiceover, and then I started kind of submitting locally. But it's a very small market. But it did a couple of commercials there, and then when I moved to LA, when I when I got the master writer thing, it, a big portion of it was coming in to do ADR, you know, to do the voiceover over the Japanese stuff, and so that was a uh, training on the job which was great for me. I didn't get paid a lot. I didn't make a lot of money doing Master Rider, but I got a lot of ADR experience that I would have had to pay a lot of money for someone to train me to do. And I think for a lot of um, a lot of the Saban actors, that was similar. You know, even the, even the Power Rangers that came in, they had to do a lot of voiceover stuff. And so a lot of people got a lot better at it and, you know, started doing some Walla. I don't know if you guys know Scott Page, um, yeah. actor. Yeah. He, he's a great guy. I mean, he was he was really kind to me and 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 helped me. And he brought me in for auditions for a lot of the monsters that you showed. And so he'd bring in you know six or eight people, and we'd all do like an audition. And but it was really Mass Writer that kind of got me started on the the voiceover stuff. And even from there, I did some voice replacement, um, foreign language stuff, and. But it was really all, it was all Saban. It was all Morphin Network, you know, not Morphin Network, but, you know, working for, working for Power Rangers or working for Saban that, that started it out. And um, it, it was valuable, valuable experience. Now, speaking of Power Rangers, like, I mean, you, you did kind of ask her, but like, how did you get really started working for Power Rangers? Like, how did it really start? Well, I was, I mean, I'm working for Saban and, and like I said, my, they had me under contract for a year, but I only did four episodes, four additional episodes of Masked Rider to put us to 40. Mm. And then the rest of the year, there was no more Masked Rider, it was done. And so Beetleborgs was coming into production. And so they, you know, they said, okay, we're gonna put you in a couple of episodes and that way we're paying you for something. And um, one of them, one of the episodes on Beetleborgs was, I was the um, Phantom of the Opera. Yes. And that was actually, that was one of my favorite things that I did for them because I, you know, I looked at the the old movie, it's Lon Chaney, right? Uh, <laughs> I can't remember how, I, I think it's the Lon Chaney movie. You know, I, that was who the character was based on and I looked at his movements and I tried to get the voice, you know, get the, the sense of the voice, but I was, I was easy, I guess Scott, the, the um, engineer, and he does all, he did all of, Saban stuff, at least all the Power Rangers, VC Troopers, VR Troopers, and Mass Rider, and Beetleborgs. He did all of the ADR for them. I mean, he ran, he directed the studio. And so he just started bringing me in for stuff. And then at, what was nice is when I started working for Power Rangers, they finally were under a SAG contract. So they moved from non union to SAG. And somehow, I don't know how Saban did it, they kind of negotiated with the union. They still were paying less than if you had got a regular union job, but you were getting paid much more, uh, you know, than their non-union contracts. And there were very little residuals. I still get like these, you know, two dollar residual checks for Time Force. Uh, you know, all the voices I did, or or the Zap, Doctor Zask and stuff. But um, you know, it moved into SAG which, you know, now you could get benefits and various things like that. So it was great when Scott brought me in to do voiceover stuff because at least I was earning, you know, wages in the union and that, that goes towards your benefits and things like that. And 
again, it was great voiceover experience. And, uh, you know, you, you'd come in and like the pictures that you showed me of the various monsters, we'd come into the room and, and you just start playing around with what does this guy, what does this guy, what does this monster, what do you think he should sound like? Because you didn't have to match, you didn't have to match the Japanese voice, you know, because we were completely dubbing over the whole thing. So you got to create the vocal character, even though the, you know, the suit was already built. And um, so that was fun too. And they, they did tweak a lot of stuff. You know what I mean? Like they took even uh, Dragon, Count Dragon, you know, they, they would yeah. tweak my voice a little bit for that character. But um, uh, it was fun to create those, those vocal characters. And I, uh, a lot of them were the, you know, the monster of the day, the monster du jour, but there were one or two recurring voices too that it was nice to have a through line even though you're just doing voice acting, it still ha was nice to have a through line with a uh, voice character. Yeah, I, I rem yeah, funny. I honestly think that your episode, The Beetleborgs, was definitely the creepiest, and that is saying a lot considering that there's an episode later on where the three main characters literally lose their heads. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did, uh, the other episode of Beetleborgs was we were a rock and roll band and I was yeah. a member of the rock and roll band and we were kind yes. of it's like we were doing a parody of a parody of um, Spinal Tap, Spinal Tap <laughs> you know? so it was kind of like okay let's do a parody of Spinal Tap which is a parody of all the yeah. 70s rock and roll bands but um, you know that was a lot of fun and, and that was that was one of the first times I actually got to be me even though I had a kind of a kiss wig like a, a, a Gene Simmons wig on. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it still was. I wasn't under a ton of makeup. And then uh, when I was when I was the Phantom of the Opera, that was the first time I prosthetically, like I had to sit in a sit in a makeup chair for an hour and a half, two hours before each episode. You know, that's some some actors have to do that. <laughs> you know, if you get cast in a Star Trek series and you're some alien you know i got a little experience a little experience doing that but oh god i i definitely would rather be cast as spock than wharf just saying. yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> okay well out of all the characters you've ever done the voice uh, out of all the villains you've ever done the voice for which one was your most favorite yeah i think it was the the chrome the chrome one the one that had the hood and it okay. almost looked like a yeah. That. Oh, okay. Um, because it wasn't about being like a voice, growly kind of character, but um, dare, dare I say it was a little more effeminate, but evil and menacing. <laughs> and so it was interesting. I mean, because I think I myself was trying to find contrast because after I'd done a few voices and it's like, you look at, generally when you look at a monster, you think of evil. <laughs> and, and it was nice to kind of get more into the Riddler evil, you know, that kind of, yeah. uh, I don't want to say evil mastermind, but, you know, a little more uh, cerebral than uh, just growling and threatening. <laughs> and and your character almost killed a 13-year-old, so... Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, there's a, the, a lot of child endangerment. I mean, Beetleborgs is, is crazy child yeah. endangerment. And then... Um, uh, my the episode when I was Doctor Zaskin, the original, you know, the one that I was just cast. That, yeah. As you said, it was supposed to be a one-off for that character. My daughter got kidnapped, and you know, she. So she, my daughter, who was I want to say, the <laughs> character was 10, 10 or twelve years old. The actress was was not very old. I mean, you know, she was like ten or eleven, and um, you know, so she was kidnapped and. Child endangerment is our thing, or it was their thing, you know. <laughs> I know, I remember. Like, you know, you watch this now, they don't do any, they legit don't do shit anymore. I'm like, yeah, they, no, no, the closest we got to that was in an episode of Samurai where, where our monster just told the kid, that, you know, you should make yourself fall <laughs> off of like a hill or something. No, not a hill, but like off a slide yeah. or something. And then I might bring your dad back to life or something like that. <laughs> That's true. Um, now it goes to the next question, Mike. Can't, I'm like, see, go to your doctor now. <laughs> see, oh, fine. Doctor Zaskin, <laughs> can you tell us your experience, Phil, um, playing on uh, Doctor Zaskin's time force? I don't know if this would interest anybody, um, but so I got cast as Doctor Zaskin, and, and and this was after 
So after Beetleborgs and after the year expired of my contract, they were no longer, it was no longer financially uh, convenient to cast me. Because when they cast me in Beetleborgs, it's like, in a way, we don't have to pay him because we're already paying him. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, uh, but once that uh, year was over, my, my second year, my contract was filled. Everything I did for Power Rangers was they cast me because they liked me, mm. you know, versus, hey, he's a, he's a cheap he's a cheap date, you know, <laughs> we could get an episode or two out of him and, and, and save some money. But, um, so everything I did for Power Rangers was, um, out of my own merit, I guess, or whatever you want to say. And so Zaskin was great. Uh, it, it took them a long time to, uh, say yes to me. You know, I, I had done some screen tests. I read, and I don't know if they were, I don't know if it, they were looking for somebody older or maybe somebody looked, I don't know what, you know, if I didn't have quite the look they wanted, but, uh, you know, obviously they, they ended up going with me. And um, it was really nice to, to play a young father and not having been a father yet. Um, so that was a new experience. And it's, it's, it is interesting, you know, you first day on the set, you meet a child, the, the actress, uh, I wish I remembered her name, but she, you know, she's 12 years old, her mother's there. And she's moved from Colorado Springs to LA to, you know, to do a pilot season. And, you know, she got cast in this. And in those few minutes, we have to try to create a bond where I'm her father and she's comfortable with me. And at least her mother was there and you don't want to be creepy. You know, you don't want to be like, I'm this old man and you have to like me now. Uh, Or just, you know, I mean, even if you're in your thirties, a 10 year old thinks you're, you know, over the, what, whatever old and and so i was i was trying to be cool with her but i also was like this was a challenge as an actor it's like to to really try to be as convincing as possible as a father and get that relationship with the child and i mean i you know we had a scene outside a house where i think i was going to work and she was kind of saying goodbye to me and after that we didn't have any scenes together so we only had one scene as as a father and daughter but um it, it just was. had to be just close enough that a 10 year old girl would be willing to bargain her teddy bear exactly. to an armed and dangerous ah. mutant. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. I remember that. Oh, how but, cute. <laughs> but when they oh, did they- bring me back, you know, when they decided to cre- uh, have Dr. Zaskin as a recurring role, <laughs> um, I was working at Magic Mountain in a stunt show, the Batman stunt show, and it was based on the Batman with uh, Poison Ivy and Mr. Freeze. Uh, the Uma Thurman, yeah. uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Schwarzenegger version, and so I was, I was, um, I was a, I was an actor turned stuntman. So I wasn't a stuntman first, and so they taught me how to ride a motorcycle, and I got better and better at it, and I got a little more cavalier with a motorcycle as my skills got better. But I, inj- I ended up injuring myself on the motorcycle, and I really, I blew out my left knee, and it was pretty severe, and I had reconstructive knee surgery. And so in that interim, they said, oh, we'd like to bring you back as Dr. Zaskin. And I'm laid up, I'm on painkillers and sleeping pills. And, but you know, I'm not gonna say, no, I don't wanna do it. And, and I had already established the character when I was healthy. And so the second episode, or the, the next episode I, I returned, I was supposed to come into the Red Rangers, uh, uh, is it Eddie, Eddie Jones Jr.? his character, the the father of the Red Ranger who right. was the company. I was supposed to walk into his office and I couldn't walk yet. I was on crutches and just standing up was painful because of the surgery. Mm-hmm. And it was funny because they they cast a photo double for me just to walk into the room. Mm-hmm. And here I am a stunt man. I mean I'm you know an actor and I'm a stunt man and I have a double to literally just <laughs> walk into the room. And you know, so they tried to match the me from the back and they gave the guy my, you know a costume just a suit just like mine and he walked in and then when i filmed my dialogue i was just propped up on a um, a crutch and then when they're ready to film they take the crutch away and i would just kind of stand there on one leg <laughs> and say my lines and then on the subsequent episodes i got more and more mobile you know i i, I could i could ambulate a little bit more and i wasn't so drugged up but i i I don't know the last time I saw that episode. I probably looked pretty dazed uh, and confused, but I did have uh, I did have a body double just to come in and walk into the room. So, 
I love the fact that this show actually existed because I love, but I always, I was enamored with the idea of a bug themed superhero. So when I saw the syndicated on TV, because I came to America after the show was canceled, I was just really excited. And Dragon was definitely a scary villain because like I said, he's like a Bond villain combined with Dracula because of the golden face. So, so do you have any fun stories of, or experiences while playing the role of Lord Dragon? Count Dragon, sorry. <laughs> well, we, we, we spelled it with an E, so yeah. we pronounced it Dragon. Dragon, yeah. Some people would say Dragon, yeah. but I'm like, I, I grew up in Washington, and which is next door to Oregon, <laughs> and a lot of people call Oregon, Oregon. And I'm yeah. like, well, if the people in Oregon call Oregon, Oregon, then it must be yeah. pronounced Oregon. And we just said Dragon, uh, though, you know, pronounce it however you want. But, and like, if, if like Nefaria, <laughs> if you're nefarious, mm -hmm. you, you know, you're nefar that's how you pronounce nefarious, but they called her nefaria and everybody would say nefaria and it's like, well, no, it's nefaria, but they're like, but it's nefarious, but whatever, it was countering. Oh, yeah, like, so, like that, like that episode of Super Mega Force, Vrock is back. Yeah. Vrock is back. Not Vrock, Vrock. Well, we, um, uh, they, you know, like I told you the story about casting, which was, yeah. I felt like I was a little duped, but it was exciting to, you know, to be on a television series. And, and back in the day, they would they would send the scripts to your house and scripts change. So then the color of the script would change and outside my door would be a blue script. And then, uh, you know, a half a day later would be a, a red script and an orange script and a green script because they would do rewrites. But it was, you know, it was fun to kind of be in the inner workings of a, of a television show and not just be a guest star or doing a one liner or a day player. And so that was a nice, you know, experience. I would say the one thing is I, I did feel like my character, Count Dragon, was kind of redundant. Uh, you know, my storyline after 40 episodes got a little repetitive of, you know, I, I want the powers of the Masked Rider and I want to destroy you and, and I'm your, and I was his uncle, um, but there was no sort of, you know, they, they never they played the relationship. They deeper to a relationship, people. yeah. You know, they never kind of delved into the relationship other than it's like, it's almost like he stole the powers and I want them for myself. Yeah. So we never had a, we never had a, a scene together, yeah. TJ and I, um, but we, you know, so I, I didn't feel like the, the family aspect was, was examined. Mm -hmm. So for me as an actor, it was challenging to kind of each episode to somehow, I, I, I don't, know if i really achieved it but you know to make it a little different or to make the stakes different or something but it it didn't seem like they were that interested in it uh, you know they're just like do your lines just like i said we would film clusters and so i'd be doing three you know it's like are we in episode six seven or eight right now okay right. what happens in eight okay now we're jumping over to six and now we're in seven okay six and eight my lines sound a heck of a lot the same uh, whatever, don't worry about it, just do it. And, um, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, so I was, I was surprised at the second episode of uh, Time Force. I apologize for jumping between topics. I was surprised that the second episode you filmed was the 30th episode of Time Force, since you actually did also show up in the 20th episode, but I guess you guys filmed it later. So I well, do find it. The same, they did the same thing with Power Rangers. Uh, they had, you know, their formula, Saban's form yeah. formula was this kind of cluster because mm -hmm. they're getting, you know, they have the footage from Japan and they're and I think Japan was a year or so ahead. So, you know, they 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 could they could write the episodes around the footage they had and then they would just do these blocks. And so that's like when I said that uh, Power Rangers went to SAG, a uh, Screen Actors Guild contract, they stayed with a cluster. So you weren't hired per episode, you were hired per cluster. And so if you were working on two episodes as an actor, you think, oh, that's great. I'll be paid you know, I'll be paid for this episode and this episode. And they're like, no, no, you're just paid for a cluster. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're, we're getting three shows out of you for the price of one. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess you, to go back to your question of Dragon, um, I, you know, I, I, and I was a, I was a fighter. I, I did a lot of training in my, in my, my training was with sword fighting, a lot of kind of uh, Western European sword fighting. And my costume, I couldn't lift my arms above higher than this because of those shoulders. Yeah. And I had zero peripheral, uh, you know what I mean, because of the yeah. because of the helmet. And I had a dresser. 
Oh, I know what was what was great about Masked Rider was uh, Vern Toyer, uh, yeah. many me. He came on as Furbus. I don't know if you remember Furbus. Yeah, Furbus. Furbus yeah. was his friend, his you know alien. Yeah. Pet yeah, friend. I I actually did a video uh, just last week, yeah, and it centered around Mass Rider and Dragon Knight. So I did include Dragon and uh, Furbus in the video clip, almost right next to each other, mind you. So they Furbus was a puppet, and I think they felt like he wasn't lifelike enough. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they, they wanted the character more interactive, so they hired Vern, and this was before Mini Me and you know before Austin Powers, <laughs> and. Um, so he came onto the set and he was, you know, he's a really, really nice guy. You know, obviously he's, yeah. his height was great for the costume. And, and he, you know, we didn't hang out too much, but we would be in the kind of the catering area or something. And we got talking a little bit. It was, but it was nice to have met him and know him before he blew up. Then he, you know, then he mm. he's in a lot of, he's been in a lot of, well, a lot of stuff since then, but we had the same dresser uh, Rosemary was her name in it. So I had my own dresser because that costume was so cumbersome. And then we, the, on Masked Rider, they would fight maggots. Like maggots would come out of the ground and he fought, they were kind of the soup, the- uh, Yeah, monsters. The uh, they, yeah, they would, they would come in sets of three. Yeah, exactly. So those guys, those uh, costume actors would have their dressers. And then if we were working the same day, you'd have all these fans going because the only thing, my costume wasn't as hot because my mouth was exposed. It wasn't behind anything. So I couldn't complain because they were all moving around, you know, in fully uh, enclosed costumes. And I I just had a lot of thick makeup on yeah. and a lot of clothes and a lot of thick clothes. And I had a black unitard and, and a hood. And then they'd put that helmet and those kind of shoulder pads on me and yeah. that big belt. But my range of motion was almost zero so then I couldn't do anything active, you know what I mean? Like, and there were, I think there was some Japanese footage where Dragon fought somebody. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was in the uh, penultimate episode of the show, of, of the Japanese version of the show. But it's like the final episode of the American show. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, it, I mean, I, 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 I just remember, I don't know, it wasn't my favorite part of playing Dragon, but the hardest part was I'd have to grab those eggs or the monster would be in a in a glass egg and then I would kind of drop it down into a tube to send it to Earth to battle uh, Mass Rider. And I'd have to, I my gloves had metal fingertips. Mm -hmm. so I'd have to grab this glass egg with the fingertips mm -hmm. and then bring it over and they always wanted to see the monster inside, you know, the, the figure yeah. of the monster. And then I'd had to put it in the whatever it was that transported it to Earth. And it was a lot harder than it looked. <laughs> and then to remember the lines and then to get it positioned correctly and not drop it was uh, was not easy, but. Yeah, it's like, it's like uh, playing a, a prize grabber claw with a blindfold, basically. Exactly. I think the whole thing about Mass Rider was like, so the family has, a, you know, a black son. Yeah, a apparently both daughter, A Japanese mother and a, ca a Caucasian father, and there was never anything about like how this family got together. How okay, so I rewatched the show, and apparently both kids are adopted, oh. which which doesn't make sense to me because honestly, the, the actress playing the daughter, she kind of looked like half white, half Asian. So, yeah, so she she could yeah, she, she could have completely been biological, and just they adopted a son because maybe they just couldn't get a son, you know, yeah. the, the natural way. But you know, no problem getting Japanese Spider Man to be your third <laughs> son. Sorry, your second son. Yeah. The plot of Japanese Spider-Man is almost the same as American Mass Rider. <laughs> no, I have a theory about Mass Rider because it's interesting, Mike, that you say that uh, you like the fact that uh, this character was descendant of insects. Yeah. And I, in a weird way, I think that was maybe our downfall because it's one thing to it's one thing for people to embrace like, okay, you know, humans are descendants of apes. But I think I'm an ancestor. Uh, saying like humanoids or descendants of insects, somehow it was funny because he would talk, you know, yeah. he'd talk <laughs> in the back or whatever. And, and he, and he, you know, he had a relationship with insects and, and, and the maggot whole thing, you know, fighting the yeah. maggots was in a way kind of fighting his own race. Yeah. yeah it's like, right yeah, it's, it's, it's like having an ice cream bender in an ice cream shop to quote Doug Walker. 
it's like it's like what do i do I, like i have nothing to bet oh wait i'm in an ice cream shop <laughs> yeah so, so i for some weird moral reason i thought that i'm not saying that was the reason that we only had 40 episodes but on some weird level I, i'm sure that might have turned some people off to say i mean yeah, he's from another planet so we're not saying that people of earth are descendant of insects but he looks just like everybody else in the you know he is a human or he's a humanoid and to say he's descendant of insects i i i don't know <laughs> yeah and if anything like maybe maybe some nitpickers could be thinking well if he has entomopathy why can't he just besides power rangers and of course mass spider or anything saban related what project you had fun doing or how it was memorable uh, I, did mention, I did mention Beetleborgs, uh, you know, the Phantom of the Opera. It was it was fun to try to get uh, to nail that classic image of the Phantom of the Opera and try to get the gestures and the voice and I mean the gestures and the the energy of it, which you know for a young audience they don't know. They, they <laughs> I'm sure they haven't seen the original. Uh, it wasn't the original, but you know the classic Phantom of the Opera, but. But I felt like that was my job, and and it, we got to uh, shoot in Santa Paula. There was one morning where, um, uh, you know, Santa Paula's kind of on the way to Santa Barbara, and so they put us up there. And then I think I was in the makeup chair at four in the morning or something, and we were doing a scene on the street, um, and uh, so it was a little bit more like being in a movie or being in a real TV show that stuck. I was always stuck at the sound stages. Um, and it was fun to work with the cast. You know, there were so many fun characters in that show and everybody, you know, was fun to work with. And it, it, it felt more like a family where Masked Rider, we were all in the sound stages and we all had our kind of own green rooms. But I I, I never felt like we gelled as a cast. It, I mean, we, we all did our jobs and we got along and we were kosher, but you know, where, where the, the Beetleborgs people seemed a little more kind of family you know, in it together, but um, but I, I I think I still think Doctor's asking, I because it was supposed to be just a guest starring role and it turned into a recurring role, but I feel a little bit like they liked they like me, uh, you know, <laughs> that they liked the character enough to bring him back. Mm. Uh, you know, that's always it, it's always a good feeling when they. You know when they when they say hey we like your work or or we like this character you created enough to bring him back or maybe that was their intention all along but they didn't want me to know you know and they wrote it and that they knew they were going to write him into the storyline but um you know i and i enjoyed i don't know why it, i got to fight too i actually got to fight uh even though the power rangers were kind of fighting for me i got to do a little fight scene which was fun for me because that was something i trained in doing and now i actually got to fight and uh, you know all the Power Rangers fight doubles were in the room, and 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 I knew some of I knew some of them already, so it was it was good to good to work with the stunt team. And and then there was the scene where Doctor Zaxkin got picked up and thrown onto a table. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And um, it was it was probably for me the biggest stunt I had done on film. And they. You know, we had a, uh, it's called a gator back that a motorcyclist would wear that you put on your spine to protect your spine. Yeah. It's like a gel. So I had a gator back and I had a lab coat on to kind of hide it. And they wanted it to look like the person picked me up over their head and slammed me on the yeah. table and, you know, cleared out all the, the tubes and everything. And I wasn't really worried, but they started getting me worried because of the preparation. You know, it was like there was all this preparation and all this talk. And I, maybe they were maybe they were worried that because I was the actor that I was going to hurt myself and then they'd be kind of screwed. But we did one we did it in one take, and I mean, seeing it in production, it was like it wasn't the coolest stunt ever done. You know, yeah. it was all right, but uh, that was fun. It was fun to get to do my own stunts in that sense because mm -hmm. that was something that I had trained to do, and I was doing stunts across the street in the Batman stunt show. You know, so I'm like, don't treat me like a a baby but actually when i was in that episode of beetleborgs uh, with the rock and roll band i was supposed to jump jump from um the, the top floor, floor uh, the second floor to the bottom floor in the set you know the haunted house set yeah and it and again it's like my i just i had recently broken my i recently uh you know injured my leg not broken it but injured my knee and it was reconstructed 
And I want to say it was about a year later. And it's like, the last thing I want to do is jump one story on a newly, um, you know, physically therapied <laughs> leg that yeah, I was yeah. getting back on walking. So again, they got a stunt double for me. And here I am like a stunt man with a, uh, a body double walking into a room. And then a few months later, a stunt double doing a pretty, a pretty easy jump, a one story jump onto a pad for a stunt person is like, you know, walk in the park. In a way, you could say, you know, you made it in Hollywood when, when the stunt double gets his own stunt double. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just remember you had a brief appearance in a certain movie. I'm not going to say the name of because I think the title might be a little inappropriate for our show. Oh. But it's about a certain Mormon superhero. Oh, yeah. yeah. I remember that. Ray Parker and Matt Stones. I mean, if you don't want me to say the title. I, I mean, I don't know if we're, I, I'm, I'm not saying because I don't know if uh, Ryan's okay with that saying the name. Go ahead, go ahead, just go ahead. Okay, okay. Orgasmo. <laughs> so I like to think of it, I mean, obviously Trey Parker and, and Matt Stone have gone on to amazing, great, uh, extremely financially beneficial uh, projects and stuff. And they, um, I didn't realize what I was doing in a sense that, how important that not important but i mean like it was going to be uh more viewed than i thought yeah and i was working with like people who in the porn industry yeah pornography industry like some of the actresses were were uh pornographic actresses that i was working with and i did a fight scene with ron jeremy so i got to fight but i but the whole point of my character is that i was an awful actor and an yeah. awful fighter and that's why Trey had to come in. Trey uh, Parker's character had to come in to replace me. But I consider myself the original Captain Orgasmo. Yeah. So yeah, you're yes. the original actor to play the character yeah. before Parker you left. Captain Orgasmo, but I was the original. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, no, I was surprised by how much I enjoyed that movie because I figured because the my friend who showed me the movie he like almost every movie he owns is like from trauma production so i'm like oh I don't know, i'm guessing this is just another trauma black comedy but no no this is a trey trey matt stone thing i'm like okay let's watch this <laughs> no, i think it i mean i think it holds up it just kind of peters out at the end yeah you know what i mean like it, it like two-thirds of the film i think are, are really yeah strong. yeah those first two-thirds were amazing <laughs> yeah i think if it kind of had if the latter third had the strength of the other two thirds, it yeah. might have been even more of a cult classic, for lack of a better word. No, but that I, was I think it's still was like three or four days of shooting at a, a mansion on Sunset in Hollywood uh, for my character. Mm -hmm. And um, it, but uh, I mean, this I know this is about Morphin Network, but in that show, uh, we were on. You know, the character the characters are fighting Ron Jeremy or I bust through a, a, a wall and I fight Ron Jeremy and at the end um, they drop a light on my head and then the director calls cut and 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 it's like who's this guy you know the character I'm playing like yeah. who did, where do we get this guy this guy is awful he can't fight he's an awful actor and so in the in the part where they dropped the light on my head there was somebody standing on a ladder a ladder with a lighting instrument and that person actually dropped the light on my head like they literally did drop the light on my head. They weren't supposed to. And you know how lights have the barn doors? Yeah. So they're a thin piece of metal where they can- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, to, to so scatter out the light. Door, that thin piece of metal like hit my head. And so if you go back and look at the movie, my reaction to having a light dropped on my head is the most naturalistic acting I've ever done in my life because I had a light dropped on my head and it hurt a lot and I was bleeding I wasn't like bleeding, bleeding profusely, but it was, I was kind of like, what the hell? <laughs> you actually dropped a light on my head and lights are heavy. You know what I mean? I was just like, oh my God. And that was a one take. We didn't do any more takes after that. And I was trying not to be a diva or, you know, I mean, but I was just but, like, really? <laughs> but if you were being a diva, then it wouldn't change anything because the character you play is a diva. And he gets fired. So, uh, you know, but I, I was, I, uh, I have a, a daughter who's 22 now and I guess she and her, uh, her friend were IMB, uh, IMDB me and she goes, dad, 
And I, I want to say she was 14 or 15. She goes, Dad, were you in a porno? <laughs> were you in a porn, you know, like, were you in a pornographic movie? And I'm like, uh, no, but when you're older, I'll explain it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I didn't I didn't know how to answer because the whole film's about filming a, you know. Yeah. Like a yeah. Porn. But the main character's a Mormon. <laughs> yeah. And what's I and I think this was Trey and Matt's humor was the only nudity in the film was like a bare male butt, yeah. and all the women were dressed scantily, but not they weren't naked. Like there yeah. were no breasts uh, in the movie if you watch it. Yeah. And it, I don't know if that was their joke. But it was funny because the the porn actresses, sorry, I don't know, the pornographic actresses, yeah. they're used to, you know what I mean? Like they were filming. They're almost expected they, to. Yeah, they were just like, do you? Do, and and b between takes, because they essentially were wearing bikinis, somebody would come up to them with a, with a coat or or a bathrobe and put it over around them in between takes, and they were like, what are you doing? Like <laughs> like why are you? covering me up or you know, like they were used you know they were used to letting it all you know to exposing everything and doing you know whatever on on film and here they were being treated like actresses and they were actresses and and they were tra treated with a little bit of respect <laughs> and it was just funny like uh, you don't need to cover me up you sure you want me to wear this bikini because i can just take it off and you could tell like trey was really the director and matt was in the movie but at that point you know, Trey really was behind the camera uh, all the time. So when South Park came and it was a, you know, Trey Parker, Matt Stone production, I just knew it, I, I, that relationship seemed mostly about Trey, but then I, you know, I kind of learned that Matt really, you know, has equal partnership, but, but in that movie, it really was directed primarily by Trey and yeah. Matt's role was, about as big as my role in that movie. <laughs> so, so what advice would you have for a, 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 a inspiring actor? Or actress. Or actress. Um, well, th this, this, like, when I went back to that story about signing the contract, you know, when they said, well, you need to sign this contract, this three-year contract to come in for a screen test. Um, at that point in my career, it was like I didn't have a lot of experience in front of the camera. And so that led to a whole that experience with Saban and, you know, all those all those shows gained, gained me a lot of experience in um, ADR and voice replacement and being in front of the camera. And, and so it was getting to learn on the job. So I didn't you know, it wasn't a SAG contract. It wasn't union at the time. Uh, so it didn't seem like a big career move, but it, but experience wise, it was great to learn on the set and, you know, get to understand all the inner workings of, of a movie set or a television set. So I guess the one piece of advice another actress gave, gave me was work begets work. So if you take work, uh, that helps you gain more work in the future where if you're very selective and it's like I'm only going to wait till the perfect role uh, you're not working and so that may not beget or you know create work so uh, and now back then there was no internet or it was very early on and now you know actors and actresses can write their own material and can have a podcast or you know you can you can create your own content much more easily um, so that ambition of, of exposure and getting to do your own material, uh, just getting out there. And if you're not getting cast, then you're doing something to create content, uh, whether it's your own writing, whether it's, you know, you and people that you've trained with, or you find other people like-minded that want to do similar material, uh, you know, get yourself the experience because you'll, it's one thing to go to training, like I myself teach at a conservatory, and most of the instructors are working actors, stunt people, you know, whatever, working in voice, working in musical theater, working in acting, and you you can go to a an institution of education, a higher institution, 
and learn, but it's so much different on the set. So whatever you can do to kind of get yourself the exposure and the experience and hopefully good things will come of it and, and, you know, newer and better jobs or when I say better, sometimes it just means higher paying. <laughs> you know? Hey, if it pays better and or has better benefits, it's still a step up. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the final question for, uh, for you, Ken, is are there any upcoming projects that you would tell the viewers or any like productions or anything? Well, I'm, uh, I, I kind of domesticated myself. Uh, uh, I, as I mentioned, Ryan, I, I'm married. I have a Filipino wife. Not that it matters that she's Filipino, but I have a beautiful wife and three. We have three kids. They're five, seven, and nine. And um, I have been spending a lot more time as a parent, but I, I still, I teach and I'm working on like live theater projects Mm. Uh, as a fight choreographer so I do stuff here in in Los Angeles and I like I was just in Boise Idaho I'm going to Tahoe next week to to coordinate a show mm. um, so it's nothing you'd really see on on the screen but it's more life live theater stuff but I that was kind of where I first started and uh, so it, it doesn't it's not such a big commitment being an actor in a show is a big commitment as a parent because you're away every night or, you know, the rehearsal process, the performance process. But as a director, I kind of get to come in, create, and then leave. <laughs> and then the actors can spend their time performing it. So um, I think I, I, I've i tried to assess if my children have the acting bug. And um, I guess that's a pun for you mass writer, writer fans. But um, they're... They're, they're interestingly kind of shy at the wrong times. Uh, so I, I don't think they have that natural, um, you know, show uh, or, or, or show off eatiness that you need as a child actor, you know, to get in front of people and just be willing to do whatever versus they'll do whatever at home. But the second they get in front of a camera or somebody else, they just clam up and they're like shy. And I'm like, well, shy is not going to make you any money. It's great to be, you know, that's great that you're shy, but I guess we'll pay for your college. So you know, instead of you uh, earning the money, but hmm. uh, no big projects right now. Nice. Uh, so that ends the 10 question, 10 question segment of our interview. Now for the fan questions, we'll do some few. So Ken, say, say hi to your viewers or the fans. Hi everybody. <laughs> so start with uh, Ken here says, behold the Lord, Oh, he's asking you to do it. You still remember to do it? That line, your voice? It's Count Dragon. Uh, uh, again, like I said, they did alter it in the, you know, in the recording, but I think it's like, the power of the Mass Rider will be mine! <laughs> Not today, <laughs> Uncle. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, anyway, so you did send a photo. I know you they show you this already? Or, yeah, so. <laughs> well, that's outside the sound stages in Valencia. And that was Jennifer, uh, Jennifer Tung. She, uh, I think she might have also been one of the reasons the show ended because she was things. And I think after a while she had no interest in doing mm -hmm. uh, stuff for Saban. And so she, I don't even know. I mean, I don't, I didn't know her well enough to like what happened with her agent and what happened with her manager. But she just essentially was like, um, I'm done. You know, like I'm do, I'm done doing this show. Uh, mm -hmm. I know she. Uh, had done an episode of Wings, <laughs> and, uh, and then you know, then she was in uh, what is it, The Fist? Enter the Fist. Enter the Fist. Um, but you know, she she moved on to bigger and better things. But she, I'm not saying she was the reason the show ended, but right about the time she wasn't in those last four episodes we talked about. Right. I, maybe she just fulfilled her contract through season one and she opted out after that. But Barbara, the the mother. Yeah. Uh, in one episode of Mass Yeah, she did Rider. become the new Nefaria. Yeah, she became the new Nefar uh, Nefaria. Nefaria, sorry. Nefaria, sorry. <laughs> um, so, but I think that was, she. it wasn't like she just, it was like she was transformed evil for one episode. Yeah. She didn't Yeah, just... like Kimberly becoming Rita Repulsa. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, if we had gone on more episodes, we would have had to place, replace Nefaria, but um, they never had to. So they just mm -hmm. kind of shot around it. 
Uh, Kevin said Bill Boy was at eight. Oh, okay, eight episodes. Okay, eighty-eight. Eighty-eight. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, oh yeah, it was thirty-six episodes in season two, not uh, thirty-five. That that was my that's my fault. <laughs> One thing that did suck was I, I I shouldn't say suck, but once I fulfilled my contract for the second year, I do two guest starring on Beetleborgs, and they just kept filming Beetleborgs. You know, they filmed a lot more and never called me in after that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, I think that's not very nice. Uh, let's see. Oh, request for you, Kenneth. If you do one of your monster voices, and there you forgot to pay the power bill. <laughs> oh, <laughs> boy. I'm trying to think of Chrome. Chrome was kind of my my Riddler voice, you know. And mm-hmm. I, I'm sorry, I forgot to. Pay. This, this is too close to home. The power bill thing. <laughs> There's a lot of expenses, you know. And the power bill, so your rates keep rising higher and higher and higher. And how do you expect me to pay all this on an evil person's salary? <laughs> that was nice. <laughs> good. Uh, actually, that was good. Actually, that was really good. Uh, Ken Brown, was it weird for you to never act like you're talking to your <laughs> that weren't there? Oh, totally, totally, totally. That That is a great question, Ken, because... Uh, you, you, they would show us the Japanese footage on a monitor and I can't even remember the other people that that were on the deck anymore like Trek and uh, you know but it would just be like okay look a, a little bit more to your right and now you're talking to this one like you know what I mean like just little shades of different uh, vocal uh, visual points of reference but there uh, I think I said this earlier there was never ever other than Jennifer Nefaria there was never any of those other characters ever mm-hmm. you know they didn't bring in somebody in costume to look like the other person they just would go over to the Japanese footage and they'd come back to our footage and the two either a two or a one of me or two of Nefaria and Dragon and and so it did seem it didn't seem like our evil crew you know like in Power Rangers you have all the yeah. All the people, you know, all the evil characters kind of together all the time. And when we were together, it was just the Japanese footage. And when it was our footage, we were alone. And so I never had a real feeling of, of, of a crew of evil um, helpers, you know, Generals. helping me try to achieve my, my evil ambitions. It always just felt like I was solo or Nefari mm-hmm. always seemed to be going off somewhere. So. Yeah. It kind of felt like a one man, uh, you know, it felt like a one man show. <laughs> uh, Paradigmesh from India says, Greetings from India. Hello. Oh, hello. Now his ask question is What color ranger would you be? Interesting because I, I worked, you know, Zaskin worked with the Red Ranger, and I, I felt like he was the leader in that version. Uh, but red's never been my color. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I kind of feel like I'd be more in a in a kind of green ranger. <laughs> I, I, I I was thinking that. that. There you go, green ranger. Might as well, green ranger. There you go. <laughs> it's funny because uh, you know sometimes my students or sometimes people will go, oh, you know, Ken was on Power Rangers, and so everybody assumes you were a Power Ranger. You know what I mean? Uh, and I'm like, no, I wasn't a Power Ranger. And it was interesting having worked with Power Rangers. Um, you know, they were non-union contracts when I was there. And and so when it when a version of Power Rangers starts doing well, like say a character like Billy or something becomes feels like becomes integral to the to the success of the show, and then those actors would feel like, okay, now I feel like I need more compensation or you know I, I want a bigger contract and it was like Saban's so like we have a formula and we cast these people uh let's I don't want to say unknown actors but people starting early in their career and the minute you start asking for more than your contract we're gonna just recast everybody <laughs> you know what I mean? so that that always seemed to be the yeah, the, was the yeah a lot of people tend to go to peace so, conferences uh you were you know out of there so <laughs> uh let's do how would you like to go to a peace conference exactly <laughs> uh let's do this one Aaron goes from argentina hi did you watch process in which you voice characters once they were aired greece or argentina um 
there did when you started showing me the pictures of the characters i i think there were some i didn't watch be and the only time i saw the characters is they would show the you know japanese footage and that's the beauty of power power rangers is you essentially have people with motorcycle helmets on and you don't have to match any lips you know what i mean and then all those monsters you notice none of them have much articulation in their mouth so as a voice actor you don't have to really match uh, for me with dragon for mast rider as you could see the japanese actors you could see his voice move so they had to write you know sometimes the the script was kind of halting or odd because they were trying to match the syllables of, of what his lips were doing mm -hmm. um so that was that was not easy but watching the episodes there were some that i watched and and i didn't have kids back then so <laughs> then i was an adult watching power rangers but i also, also back then it wasn't like they would say hey your episode is airing today you know what i mean it was just like you'd go in you do the voice and it seemed like a month or two later it would be on air and um uh you know so it wasn't like you knew exactly so in a way you'd have to watch every episode and i think it came to a point where i i was like well i i don't know if i'd be better at this if i watch it because i we we create the characters in the studio and once it's done it's done and and a lot of them were the monsters du jour monsters of the episode so because they were one-offs it's not like okay there's this character development and i want to track the development of this character is just like okay i did the voice for one of them had radio oh no was that what was the one where maybe that was beetleborgs where it was like it looked like a giant speaker like the monster had giant speakers like a boom box almost maybe i'm mixing up my beetleborgs and my power rangers sorry but um <laughs> i watched most of them but to be honest not all of them was it a bat monster by any chance bat yeah because i because like the only monster with the boom box uh on, it's on, probably like, the beetleborgs episode with the rock band probably I think about it because yeah. um i i mean i have a kind of interesting story about beetleborgs just doing the table read those three little the three kids the three young actors it's like when you empower ch child actors and you make them leads to your series as a child there's a weird sense that you have all these adults catering to you and doing whatever you want but at the same time all the adults like you have to get the work done right it's like we have an episode to shoot and these three kids start getting kind of cocky and you know what i mean like it's like oh, i don't want to do a table read right now and we're all around the table we're all gathered the director and all the guest stars and it's like you know we're here to do the work and they're kind of like i don't feel like it right now and, and it was just interesting to see the the power struggle of okay we've empowered these kids we've made them the stars of our show but we have to get a certain amount of work out of them for this to even happen they i think they did replace didn't they replace the little girl or they replaced the, the yeah one, joe one uh, of the yeah. boys or one of the the kids once i think after the first season or something yeah it was yeah it was the red beetleborg they replaced her with a slightly younger actress and the way they did it was they did like a spell where they accidentally make her look different but then when they try to make a spell to change her back they, uh the problem with the spell is that the people who witnessed the spell being cast would not take would not be with uh would not be able to see the effect of the spell so that so because we the audience saw the spell being cast she still looks like the new actress even though everyone else outside of the mansion still <laughs> thinks that she's still the same first actress the <laughs> yes uh, okay well in bewitch they replace bewitch uh, Darren, you know so <laughs> if you can if you can do that you can do anything okay guys we'll do two more guys two more um two that is I can't. Are you glad you made a figure of your monster crawling from through? Oh yeah, they did make a toy. You know, my, what's funny is my kids are toy junkies. They love toys. They love action figures. And I had, uh, you know, we we have moved a few times, and I had these uh, action figures in a box. And when I said I worked on the um, the Batman stunt show, I played all the villains. So I played Two Face, and I played um, the Riddler, and I played. Um, uh, the Joker. So I had action figures of those characters. So my kids were like 
ripping them open once they found them. Like, why do you have these toys? And I'm like, uh, don't, you know, but but I wasn't, it's not like I really played the Riddler like a Jim Carrey or something. So I'm like, it's no big deal. But the Chrome character, I felt a little more possessive of because it was, um, you know, I wasn't in the costume, but I was the voice. And they were like about to rip it open. I'm like, no, you can't rip that one open. Because then they just destroy them. They're that age where they just destroyed stuff. You know what I mean? Like they just wanted action figures to run over and throw right. and into the concrete and stuff. So I still have that one character um, preserved, but it's been in a box. I mean, it, it, I didn't do a good a good job of preserving and it's not. Keep them in carbonite. Yeah, I didn't put it in carbonite. <laughs> so before we end this interview, so Hasbro, if you're watching this, you can make a, if you can make a toy of this guy. I mean, of course, Richard was a good friend, but if you can make a toy, a one-off toy of this monster, you can make a toy of, you know, Chromite, <laughs> Nazor. You know, <laughs> yeah, guys. let's get a three-pack of Rednecks, Nazor, and Mandalock. Yeah, let's go. Wild yeah. Force Generals. Let's yeah. do and, and maybe, and maybe you know, like actually make lightning figures of Masked Rider characters all together. You know, I, 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 I know. Uh, I know has I, was a, <laughs> I was doing a show in Indonesia, and I was in, um, I want to say, a Tokyo, Tokyo airport, and there was a toy shop, and there were all these. Mass Rider care, you know, what I mean, like yeah. all these figures similar to Mass Rider, and because of the language difference, I was trying to ask questions about you know who they were, and and I and I I wish I knew more about the original series, you know, series in Japan and everything, but um, but I was kind of like, wow, I guess I could still go to Japan and get some of these <laughs> toys. At yeah, least uh, Black and Black Rex are family. really popular in Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, we'll do one more. Let's see who wants to do the last one. Oh, Michael Washington says, hey, bud, our sponsor. Hello. Hey, Mike, make, hey, Michael. A, make a can some t-shirts from his monsters. Come on, you can do it. Count Dragon t-shirt. Uh, t-shirt? Yeah, because so Michael Wa so Michael Washington, he is the uh, owner of Carson's Corner, one of our sponsors for merch, and he actually makes good merch based on Power Ranger stuff. So, well, here we go. I don't know if you can read my shirt here, but I'm gonna turn around. Oh, oh, yes, my God, yes. Oh, so uh, Mike, if you're watching this, I'll just message you later. So Maybe I have a crew. I have a crew jacket. And the zipper broke, but it's a crew jacket, and it says Mast Rider on the back, and it says Count Dragon. And nice. um, I'm like, uh, it's. I, I never. I, I keep meaning to get the, the zipper fixed, but it, it's kind of a, a nice winter, especially in LA. It never gets that cold. It's kind of a light winter jacket. So they, every once in a while, they. I don't want to say they took care of us, but they did do. You know, they made a shirt for us for free. And I got a crew jacket for free, you know. <laughs> like, uh, uh, maybe friend. that's where the uh, money that you weren't paid for went exactly. towards. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, when, the, when the trading cards came out. Oh, and, yeah. Wait, did uh, we have trading cards for Mass Rider? Yeah, oh, well, I trading cards for a while. No, I didn't. And, uh, actually, if you have one second, I'm going to pull something out if you don't mind. Awesome. I knew they made them for Power Rangers. Oh, there was a Mass Rider card, you know what? Oh, my cousin! My cousin has like four packs. Well, back then, that's when he was like, "Yeah, he was into it." How much? So, so uh, Kuya, Kuya John, uh, if you're watching this, yeah, I, I still have your Mass Fighter cards. I don't even still have them. Oh, All right. there we go. So, this is a mat made by wow. Colgate. It's a ma Mass Rider um, toothbrush. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, yeah, I can see the. And there's logo. Furbus. Uh, Furbus is on the handle there. Oh. <laughs> and then this is this bag that's seen better days. Here is a Happy Meal. Oh. And this was Mass Rider toys in the Happy Meal. So it's a lot of vehicles. There's yeah. the Mass Rider. And one of his motorcycles. Oh, oh it's uh, and there's it's just, uh, Furbus. There's Furbus. 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 Wow, wow, that mold. He actually looks like a Furby. <laughs> All right, so yeah, uh, yeah, Furby. Yeah, I don't know which came first, Furby or Furbus. I so, but, um, <laughs> okay. so I these are 
toys my kids don't even know I had. But it's funny when you're in the middle of something, you know, when it was happening, this was a hell of, this was a long time ago. But when it was happening, it's like there were Happy Meals and there were toys and <laughs> and there were trading cards and and it's like you're getting paid. Uh, I'll just tell you, it was it was two hundred dollars a day. Mm. Um, it was two hundred dollars a day when you worked. Mm. You know, so if I filmed five days a week, and if I came in to do ADR, like if I if they needed me to say one thing, they would pay me that fee for the day. But you know, for an actor doing television, that wasn't a lot of money. Um, and then when the second year. Uh, kicked in, you got a 10% raise. So then you'd get 220, you know, so you know, so for the second season, if there was a second season, you get 220 a day. Uh, you know? It's like, so it's like it you get weird, six but, days but of pay for five days of work. There was all this merchandise, and it wasn't like it was my, I mean, I don't know, like TJ was the, yeah. the lead, but actually, and his picture was on, I think there were like, probably like activity books and things like that with his picture on it but um i mean sometimes my picture wasn't my picture it was the japanese actor mm. do you know what i mean it was even the picture you put on your banner that isn't me that's the japanese me uh <laughs> that's <laughs> japanese uh rendition of me so there was a picture of jennifer and i that was me uh in the costume but um so there was a lot of stuff out there and you just start feeling like okay, signing that contract maybe wasn't the smartest thing I did, but, you know, as I mentioned earlier, work begets work. So it was, it was a start and, and, and it gave me a lot of experience, at least in ADR and kind of opened up a world that, that I didn't have much exposure to. And so, uh, you know, it, in retrospect, in, I remember I was doing Shakespeare in Nevada at the Nevada Shakespeare Festival when uh, Mass Rider aired. And so, I was I was doing live theater and I was staying at the Hard Rock. That's where they put us up. And so I woke up early Saturday morning to watch, you know, like to watch my show, Mass Rider. And so I, I had just filmed like they they we weren't part of any of the process of developing it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I remember when the theme song came on came on for Mass Rider. I was like, that's our theme song. That's a piece of sh you know like that is the yeah. worst thing it, it was like this is my this is our show yeah. and that's the theme song that's awful you know <laughs> so I, I you know you take some ownership but at the same time it, you're it's completely out of your hands and uh you know mm -hmm. you just do your job and do it to the best of your ability yes i'll do one more guys one more because of course getting late so Ken Brown's asking, what's his hatred said in Dragon Hat? And you wish you could have developed it. Oh, okay. Okay. Wait, what's this hatred said in Dragon Yeah, because in the episode of uh, Power Rangers, A Friend Need, you know, there's a line where where uh, Zed and Rhea are like, uh, Count Dragon, I hate Count Dragon. Uh, Count Dragon, I love that guy! <laughs> well, I... I they... You know, they're marketing. Somebody at one point just said, like what I said earlier about when the Power Rangers felt like, hey, this show's success has a lot to do with my, you know, my character, or my ranger. Uh, you know, the Pink Ranger is why people tune in, and Billy's why, you know, like, and all this stuff. And it's kind of like they were always, you know, like VR Troopers or Mass Rider was an offshoot of, of Power Ranger of Power Rangers. Uh, even Be even Beetleborgs is somehow, I don't know, I, I used to understand more how they were all related, but they're all, you know, spin-offs. And so I, I'm assuming they're just creating this relationship because it's a spin-off of Power Rangers and they're trying to connect the universes. I don't, it, it, now that we have Marvel Universe and, and I thought they did an amazing job of connecting, you know, whether it's Black Panther or Iron Man or Captain America, you know, like create, they actually created a universe. I don't think morph, the Morphin universe is, is really well constructed, but I think they were doing their job or trying to create a, a connection between these various other franchises or offshoots. But someone just said the whole purpose was to sell toys. 
you know, it's like, just shut up, do your job. We're trying to sell toys. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, we're just trying to sell swords and we're trying to sell guns and uh, uh, not shut up and do your job. You know, they, I think they were interested in the quality of the show, but it was like, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna ask for more money, we're gonna replace you because we're still gonna sell the same amount of toys. And um, so, you know, it, it's a business, and uh, I I I don't know how many people who watched both episodes got kind of got the relationship. I wasn't part of it because I I don't think I was doing Power Rangers yet. I just remember when I was shooting um, Mass Rider the the sound stages right next door to us were were more you know were, were power rangers sound stages and that felt like uh you know that was where the big boys were and we were the mm. you know we were the the red-headed stepchild show and <laughs> you know so when you got to enter the the power ranger sound stages then you were really because they had more security like we had little to no security and then if you went over to the Power Rangers sound stages, you had to have clearance to get inside. And, um, you know, even working for the company, I'd go over there and they'd be like, excuse me, why are you here? I'm like, oh, I'm dropping off my resume. You know, I <laughs> I hear they're looking for Dr. Zaskin, so I'd like to audition and like, okay, you can come in, but just drop off your resume and then go turn around, you know. They're, you don't want, they didn't want anybody to see this, the sets or the secrets or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it was a little more, it just felt uh, big time. I don't know if that's the word, but you know, a little more important. So. Uh, oh, that's nice. All right, guys. So that's pretty much the question. So again, thank you guys for being part of a special interview. And of course, Kent Mark Marks. And it's also, it's a privilege having you here for our first Power Ranger interview too. So thank you. You're welcome. I, I hope uh, we covered a lot of different things, but I, I you know, I, I did have, uh, an interesting relationship with Saban and I got to dabble in their different worlds. Uh, I never was <coughs> immersed in any of them, but I, I got exposed to a lot of it. And um, when everything moved to Australia, that was a very sad day for me. I think New, Z New Zealand, New Zealand. New Zealand, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, New Zealand, yeah. yeah. Um, like we're taking three people with us, <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, anyways. So before we leave, uh, Mike, I mean Mike, Ken, see Mike because I see I'm your talker. So Ken, where can um, they find you? If you have any social media or any websites or anything you want to watch? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of low profile, so I, oh, okay. my All wife, right. uh, she works, uh, she works, I don't I really say what she works in, but she doesn't like to have a media presence and, mm -hmm. and so we kind of keep, we keep out of, uh, I mean, I'm, I really appreciate you looking me up on Facebook, and uh, you know, I really enjoy doing this, and I hope, I hope some people enjoyed reminiscing and hearing stories. But um, we kind of stay, stay out of the <laughs> limelight or the trackability. Let's say. <laughs> no respectable, worries. respectable, respectable, respectable. Uh, Mike, where can I find you? Uh, you can find me on the top side of the grid uh on instagram at uh, at chrono underscore just underscore cosplay and you can find me on the underside of the grid on twitch at twitch.tv slash boken kabuto i uh, find me instagram at your boy for seven please follow us on facebook instagram youtube at the morphin network all right guys thank you so much happy sun happy sunday happy for july weekend uh, uh yes hope you guys had fun fireworks barbecue everything i know i had yesterday <laughs> Um, so, but anyway, guys, uh, again, see you guys again this week for another interview or podcast. And yeah, again, thank you, Kent, for being part of our special guest. Thank so, you, Mike. Mike, it was nice talking with you, and uh, uh, good luck with your podcast and everything in the future. Yes, Same to so. you. So, we'll do a goodbye wave, guys. Goodbye. Today's Morphin Network video is brought to you by Carson's Corner. Carson's Corner is a black LGBTQ owned small business. They sell merchandise and apparel on pop culture franchises. These franchises include King of the Hill, Dragon Ball, Sailor Moon, and of course, most importantly, Power Rangers. If you are interested in getting their amazing merch, be sure to check them out at www.carsonscorner.com.